what's different about a 1919 and a 2019 chicken? If you were to see those two chickens side by side, if we could today have a chicken that was the standard barnyard chicken of, of 1919 versus the standard industrial chicken of today, you would probably think that they were not related. Chickens today grow to twice the weight in half the time that they did before World War II. In fact, back in, let's say, in 1919, in the time of, I don't know, our grandparents or our great-grandparents, chickens were really the, the province of individual farms, often actually of farm wives, that they had a couple of chickens running around in the back of the farm. They were there mostly for producing eggs, and the women sold them at farmer's markets or, or sold them into general stores. That's where we get that phrase, women having butter and egg money. It's because farmer's wives had, the, had butter and egg as their particular province. And they only ate chicken as a meat when those hens were done laying eggs or when they had a couple of extra roosters that had hatched out and they didn't really need them. Then we get to World War II and that meat production that is episodic and small scale and confined to individual small farms becomes industrialized on a vast scale to feed the troops that are in the millions deploying around the world. In the midst of World War II, we get a thing that changes the world forever, and that is the discovery of antibiotics. We think that antibiotics have always been here, but really they only arise in the late 1940s. So the antibiotic era is less than 100 years old. Antibiotics get introduced to meat production, and they trigger this cascading series of changes in meat animals that you can actually see most clearly in chicken, in which animals grow more quickly, they are bred to put on weight more rapidly, um, they're bred to be more docile and more amenable to being crowded together in farms. And so in the case of a chicken, that chicken from 1919 would have been skinny and upright and weighed only about two pounds and probably had colored, colored feathers and could flap up into a tree and avoid predators. And the chicken of 2019 is a five or six pound docile, white feathered, slow moving block of protein that doesn't do much but sit on the floor of its barn and get up and eat and drink and sit back down again. When were antibiotics invented and put into regular use and what was different about health, medicine, and disease prevention before and after the introduction of antibiotics? So I think most of us think of antibiotics as a thing that has always been around because they've been around throughout our lifetimes. But in fact, they haven't been around that long. The, the first recognition of the first antibiotic is in 1928 when Alexander Fleming, the father of penicillin, as the story goes, leaves a window open in his laboratory in London probably because it was August in 1928 and they didn't have air conditioning. And two weeks later, he comes back from taking his annual vacation. He looks at, at petri dishes of bacteria that he's been growing and notices that something is killing the bacteria that he had streaked onto the plates. And he figures out that what is killing them is something secreted by a mold that had blown in that window. That mold is penicillium mold. And from it, we get the first natural antibiotic, penicillin. But we don't get penicillin until about 1943 because it's a very hard drug to develop and grow at scale. And it's really the influence of the war and so many soldiers and sailors being so gravely injured that really pushes industrialization of penicillin. So what does all this mean? Before the advent of antibiotics, any injury could kill you. It would start an infection for which we had effectively no treatment except maybe ice baths and aspirin and cold compresses. And if you, know, if you got injured in some remote part of your body, maybe amputation. This is not a theoretical thing for me. One of my great uncles was a fireman in New York City. He was injured at the firehouse on one of his days off. Just something fell off the shelf and bumped and scratched him. And a month later, he died of what they called blood poisoning, and we now call septic shock. And that was five years before the first human trial of penicillin. So antibiotics were this astonishing gift to the world that suddenly made that unbelievable threat of infection from even minor injuries just go away. 
But as with all great discoveries, they had a downside too. Why did you write a book called Big Chicken and what was the main point of the book? So I have been, uh, as I said, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I work on public health. And I've been fascinated for a long time, for more than a decade now, by the problem of antibiotic resistance and what we do about it. And what antibiotic resistance means, pretty simply, is that antibiotics no longer work. And therefore, all of those infections that we were subject to at the beginning of the 20th century are now turning around to menace us again in the 21st because effectively we wasted antibiotics. Now, we wasted antibiotics in a number of ways. And medicine really takes the blame for this first, that we give antibiotics for the wrong things, we give them for the wrong amount of time, people don't take them the way they should, and as a result, since probably the 1960s, that's only about 20 years in which antibiotics worked without question, we've been losing the power of antibiotics and having to invent newer and newer generations of them. So I got interested in this, and I, I decided to look at a particular one particular infection, which is called MRSA, or MRSA, drug-resistant staph. And I ended up writing a book that was essentially the biography of, of MRSA as a way of telling the story of how antibiotic resistance had emerged around the world. And in the midst of reporting that book, which is a story about how medicine did antibiotics wrong, I stumbled across a statistic that completely knocked me back on my heels, which was that in the United States, in a particular year, this year was actually 2011, so not very long ago, we sold in the US four times as many antibiotics by weight for use in animals as we did for use in human beings. And this just made no sense to me because how could, how could livestock be that sick? that they would need that much antibiotic. And it turned out that livestock aren't sick, that for f since almost the beginning of the antibiotic era, we've been using antibiotics not to cure animals primarily, but to make them more efficient machines for the production of meat. Now, I had just exited from a couple of years in which I had spoken to researchers and doctors and victims of drug-resistant infections and the parents of children who were killed by drug-resistant staff. And all of these people were saying to me, antibiotics are precious. Antibiotics are rare, and we need to protect them and conserve their power, and we are wasting them. And now suddenly, here were these statistics that were showing me that in agriculture, we were wasting antibiotics even more than we had in medicine. And so, as a journalist, I just had to find out more about that. And so that led to this four years that led to this book, Big Chicken. And the reason the book is called Big Chicken is that it turns out that chickens are really important to the story of antibiotics in agriculture. Chickens are the animals that get antibiotics first experimentally in 1948 that prove that what's called growth promotion as a means of giving antibiotics is going to work. And in the United States, just now, in 2018, 2019, chicken as a sector of the protein economy is turning away from routine antibiotic use. It's way ahead of cattle production. It's way ahead of pig production in not using antibiotics anymore. So to me, the chicken brackets that story of how we made this historic mistake and how we're starting to find our way back out of it again.